You are listening to another No Fair Remembering Stuff, the Tuesday edition of the Professional F Podcast, and available wherever you get your podcasts, and at our website, prolevpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There is a Patreon button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at the Professional F Podcast, P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. And it's not safe for work. This past weekend, this happened at the White House Correspondents' Dinner. But I think the most insulting scandal to fall to the feet of the Biden administration was placed at the feet of our Madam Vice President. The scandal of what does Kamala do? (laughs) Which is a disrespectful question. That's a disrespectful question because nobody ever asked that question of the vice president until a woman got the job. I'm gonna ask. I don't know what Mike Pence did. The only thing I know about Mike Pence is that he's really good at playing hide and seek at the Capitol. (laughs) You gotta be crafty to catch Mike Pence in that Capitol, baby. He'd know all the nooks and crannies. Put the camera on her on a Mike Pence joke. Don't do that. Don't be sad. They're trying to set you up, Madam Vice President. You see what they do? At the end of the day, as a vice president, the only thing, the only thing you got to do is just be better than Dick Cheney. <laughs> That's the bar. Just be better than Dick Cheney. They made a documentary about Dick Cheney. Now, I don't know much about the job of vice president, but I do know if they can make a documentary about your time as vice president, you vice president it incorrectly. <laughs> And if a VP's job is really just waiting to step in to save the country in case of emergency, then the job of vice president is a perfect job for a black woman. Shouldn't be, but it is. And whatever you do accomplish, whatever you do accomplish, all they're going to do is just give a man credit for it. Anything you do, oh, the immigration stuff, you done knocked out, you done got all this banking and you got the internet down there, you done taken care of all this postpartum stuff, they just gonna give a man credit for what you done. By the way, Mr. President, great job at being the first woman vice president <laughs> of color. I don't even know how you did that part. <laughs> Wonderful job. And the thing is, Roy Wood Jr. was speaking directly to Kamala Harris, the vice president of the United States, at the White House Correspondents' Dinner. Can you remember the last time the Vice President attended the White House Correspondents' Dinner? No, you can't. And so in this episode, we jump right in with this question. Who was the greatest Vice President in U.S. history? The man with the most sterling reputation, incorruptible, wise, and loyal to his president, even though his president was a vicious, corrupt sleazebag. And everybody knows it was Vice President Nance by a mile. He was, by all accounts, a good and decent man who didn't agree with his president politically, and his president thought he was a clown. But he always respected his role, and the role his president asked him to play as clown, even though it made him look weak and foolish. When he disagreed with the administration, he kept it to himself, and he always supported his boss. His first name was Gary, but the reason you probably can't remember his first name is because in the script, he doesn't have one, because he's fictional. He is the fictional vice president, played by Sir Ben Kingsley, serving under the fictional president, Bill Mitchell, played by Kevin Klein in the 1993 movie, Dave. But while he is fictional, the lines that actor Ben Kingsley speaks from the script by Gary Ross, are absolutely true. The job of the vice president stopped going to the second place winner in 1804. And ever since then, almost without exception, the job of the vice president is to be the instrument of the president, to go where the president tells you to go, to say what the president tells you to say, and do what the president tells you to do and occasionally break the tie votes in the Senate, but that's it. 
That's all of it. So today we're talking about vice presidents, and we're trying very hard to trace down the reason why Vice President Kamala Harris is being held to such a wildly different standard than virtually every other vice president in history, a standard that demands that she light up the sky, that she be as popular in her own right or maybe even more popular than her boss, Joe Biden, and wow the country, independent of what her boss, Joe Biden, wants her to do. Spoiler, it's race and it's gender. See also Clinton, comma, Hillary. This from Dan Abrams Live on something called News Nation is typical of the knock on Vice President Harris. Quote, President Biden is launching his re-election campaign with a big hurdle. His running mate, Vice President Kamala Harris. What are the chances she's replaced on the ticket? Unquote. Ooh, Ooh. burn, sick burn, Dan Abrams. And as you tick through all the ink being spilled over how awful Vice President Harris has been, you may notice a trend. Here are some recent headlines that will give you a hint. This is from the New York Post. Quote, Kamala Harris' word salad speech at pro-abortion rally blasted by critics. Legalizing weed was a mistake. Unquote. The Post, by the way, is Rupert Murdoch's New York sleaze rag. From the National Review. Quote, Kamala Harris incoherent again, unquote. The National Review has been accurately described by brother Charlie Pierce of Esquire magazine as, quote, America's oldest journal of white supremacy, unquote. From the City Journal, quote, the Democrats' Kamala Harris problem. Even New York Times readers are rejecting the identity politics that put her in the 2020 ticket, unquote. The City Journal is the propaganda arm of the Manhattan Institute Wingnut Welfare Outfit. Reason Magazine, quote, Harris's unpopularity creates a succession problem for Democrats, unquote. Reason Magazine is that libertarian magazine that all the Ayn Rand fanboys subscribe to. This is from the Washington Examiner, quote, Kamala Harris doesn't even understand why she's unpopular. She's so dumb. Isn't that a shame? She's so dumb. The Washington Examiner is obviously another conservative outlet. And so again, from the Washington Examiner, quote, how do you solve a problem like Kamala, unquote. And again, from the National Review, quote, is Biden losing faith in Kamala Harris, unquote. From Rich Lowry, who is the former editor and now editor-in-chief of National Review and the repository of all of Tucker Carlson's discarded bow ties, quote, the Kamala Harris problem, unquote. And because the New York Times just can't help themselves, quote, Kamala Harris is trying to define her vice presidency. Even her allies are tired of waiting, unquote. And this is pretty typical of the hot takes over at the Bulwark. The headline of Mona Charon's Beg to Differ podcast, quote, state of Biden is strong, but Kamala Harris, not so much, unquote. So, Blue Gal, who said, if we don't succeed, we run the risk of failure. (laughs) Was it Kamala Harris? No, no, it was not. It was, in (laughs) fact, the same person who misspoke the following and said, if you give a person a fish, they'll fish for a day. (laughs) They'll fish for a whole day. (laughs) They'll fish for a day if you give them a fish. With the fish you gave them. (laughs) Sure. I don't understand it, but it appears wise. And and it's the same person uh, who once said, One word sums up probably the responsibility of any vice president, and that one word is to be prepared. Be prepared to spell the word potato? Would that be the one? Yeah, you're you're guessing right. Now, maybe that's, I don't know, there's a Spanish verb, to be prepared. He meant to the single Spanish verb. But no, to be prepared is not one word. And that person is the 44th vice president of the United States, J. Danforth Quayle, George H.W. Bush's vice president, back during the good old days when everything was so much better than it is now, and a man who could have and would have bid fair to be the dumbest slab of Republican ham to occupy that little office next to the big office in the White House if Mike Pence of Hang Mike Pence fame had never existed. Both from Indiana, right? Yeah. Yeah. Indiana. We know lots of nice people from Indiana. These two are not them. These two are just typical Republican slobs from Indiana. So let us all embark on an exciting journey through the mists of time to discover what various, very serious persons 
thought of the job of vice president, its duties and privileges over the centuries. This is Daniel Webster turning down the vice presidency in 1839. Quote, I do not propose to be buried until I am dead. Unquote. Oh, and this is Thomas R. Marshall, who was vice president under Woodrow Wilson, describing the job he held. Quote, being vice president is comparable to a man in a cataleptic fit. He cannot speak. He cannot move. He suffers no pain. He is perfectly conscious of all that goes on, but has no part in it. Unquote. Here is Gerald Ford's vice president, Nelson Rockefeller. Quote, I go to funerals. I go to earthquakes. Unquote. Really, all these guys who were actually vice president. So tell me, Blue Gal, how many voters do you suppose decided they liked Jerry Ford and were all ready to vote for him, except they remembered, holy crap, Nelson Rockefeller, and just decided to stay home? Or, like Red Foreman in that 70s show, how many of them looked at Ford and asked, Hey, Jerry, (laughs) here's my question. How the hell could you pardon Nixon? About the same number who looked at George H.W. Bush and said, nope, because of Dan Quayle, or looked at John Kerry and thought, I'd like to, but damn that, John Edwards. H.W. Bush lost because of the economy, because Bill Clinton was a very good politician, and to be fair, because of Ross Perot's third-party candidacy. Kerry lost because W. ran one of the filthiest campaigns in modern history. Yep, and we we lived through it. Except in rare cases like John Kennedy reluctantly choosing Lyndon Johnson in 1960 because he could deliver Texas, nobody votes on the Veep, a job which John Adams described as the most insignificant office that ever the invention of man contrived or his imagination conceived. And Thomas Jefferson described in 1797 when he was actually vice president of the United States, quote, The second office of this government is honorable and easy, but the first is but a splendid misery. And Lyndon Johnson is also a really good example of how previous job performance is often a very poor measure of what kind of president that person may turn out to be. Before taking the job, Johnson was given this warning by John Nance Garner, who knew a little something about vice presidenting having served as the 32nd vice president of these United States under Franklin Delano Roosevelt from 1933 to 1941. Quote, I tell you, Lyndon, the vice presidency isn't worth a pitcher of warm spit, unquote. And we're not sure if he used the word spit or not, or if that was cleaned up for later audiences. Ah, There was nothing in Johnson's past at all to suggest what a monumental and successful president he would be and what a tragic and failed president he would become. Not his stint as number two to Kennedy, not his time as Senate Democratic leader, or as Landslide Lyndon, the nickname he earned in 1948 by pretty much outright stealing the 1948 Texas Senate race. Who was Harry S. Truman before he was plucked from relative obscurity to be Franklin Roosevelt's vice president? He was the former haberdasher from Missouri. He was the, quote, senator from Prendergast because he owed his political career to Tom Prendergast, the boss of the Missouri Democratic political machine in Kansas City. Truman managed to stay relatively honest during his time as Prendergast's man and rightly or wrongly valued political loyalty very highly. Despite intense criticism, Truman attended Prendergast's funeral while he was vice president. From the outside, there was no clue that this was the same man who would become the give em hell Harry that would eventually rank as the seventh greatest president in history, just behind Dwight Eisenhower. And speaking of Eisenhower, whatever became of that guy's vice president? You know, the one that Ike tried to fire, the one who saved his career with one of the cheesiest speeches in American political history. Pat doesn't have a mink coat. But she does have a respectable Republican cloth coat. He became president eventually, but it took a while. (laughs) Well, almost two terms, I should say. Almost two terms, two whole terms. And his vice president, you know, who about whom we will speak in a few moments, uh, also didn't complete his term because, you know, vice presidents have a habit of doing that. This is a quote from Teddy Roosevelt. 
I would a great deal rather be anything, say, professor of history than vice president. Here are some more quotes by and about vice presidents. I have no interest in it. Might very well turn it down indeed and probably would. Al Gore. I never had a boss. I don't know how I'd handle it. Joseph Robinette Biden, when asked in July of 2008 about the possibility they might select him to be Barack Obama's running mate. You're not going to take it, are you? His response was, I suppose I'll have to. That was Grace Coolidge to her husband, Calvin, after his nomination for vice president in 1920. Uh, In a media instant, Sarah Palin went from an unknown moose hunter to a mass phenomenon on the precipice of becoming the vice president of the United States. The late scumbag Andrew Breitbart said. The vice president has two duties. One is to inquire daily as to the health of the president, and the other is to attend the funerals of third world dictators. And neither of these do I find an enjoyable exercise. John McCain. I spent several years in a North Vietnamese prison camp in the dark, fed with scraps. Do you think I want to do that all over again as vice president of the United States? Also John McCain. What is the vice presidency? The Constitution dictates only two duties, casting the deciding vote if the Senate is deadlocked and replacing the president if he dies or is impeached. Apart from waiting for those two things to happen, you made the rest up and were duly forgotten by history. The exception being Aaron Burr, who shot someone, decisively lowering the bar for the rest of us. (laughs) That is novelist Austin Grossman, who wrote Crooked, about Richard Nixon. And then there's Ed Rendell. You know, rule one, the vice president is making sure you never upstage the president, right? It's rule one, which should remind people who have complaints about Kamala Harris not commanding the headlines, that's what her job is now. Her job is to not do that. Her job is to be number two. Her job is to be the executor of whatever Joe Biden wants her to do, just as Joe Biden did for Barack Obama. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you can imagine if she ever did upstage Joe Biden. Oh, that's all it. of those conservative outlets would be about the uppity upstart Kamala Harris that overstepping up- her role. Blah, right. blah, 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 blah. Doesn't she know her place? That uppity Doesn't black she woman. Know Doesn't her she place? know her place? I mean, her yeah. place is to shut up and do what Joe tells her to do. My God, she could be the next president of the United States. Imagine that. Mm hmm. Yeah. Some more quotes. I am Al Gore, and I used to be the next president of the United States of America. (laughs) Poor Al Gore. Uh, I hope he's doing okay. Uh, And this is Will Rogers. The man with the best job in the country is the vice president. All he has to do is get up every morning and say, how's the president? (laughs) So what are some of the most memorable vice presidents in history? And why do we remember them? I mean, besides remembering Dan Quayle for being an idiot and Mike Pence for being worse. All right. So my favorite example of this is Teddy Roosevelt, Uh who was a great president and entirely accidental. Um, President McKinley did not offer him the vice president spot because the party bosses loved him and wanted to see him do well. Oh, let's put Teddy in that job and let's see he'll grow into it and be a great man. (laughs) No, no. The political bosses of his own party in New York, where he was governor, they hated him. And his crazy ideas of reforming politics and reforming government and reforming the way we do business in this country. But he was a popular governor and he was a war hero. So the party bosses thought, hey, we can kill two birds with one nomination, right? Put him on the ticket and use his popularity to help McKinley get elected by putting him in the most impotent dead-end job in politics where his political career and his reform ideas would hopefully starve for lack of oxygen. Now, there were a few party officials, based on my research, who were nervous about this idea. One of them was RNC chair Mark Hanna, who famously cautioned, and I can't believe he really said this, but he did, don't any of you realize there's only one life between that madman and the presidency? Then six months after being inaugurated, McKinley was assassinated, which put all that power in the hands of the one man Republican Party bosses (laughs) definitely did not want to have all that power. Mm-hmm. And then there was Spiro Agnew. Spiro Agnew, by the way, is the best word to use in hangman. Yeah. Just tell people it's a federally elected official in the past hundred years and put that in there. His combination of letters, nobody ever gets it. And by the way, in addition to being an excellent <laughs> hangman clue, 
Spiro Agnew was a degenerate criminal both before and during his years as Nixon's vice president. He was hired to be Nixon's rabid attack dog. And if the hippies and the yippies and the disruptors of the systems that Washington and Lincoln as presidents brought forth in this country will shut up and work within our free system of government, I will lower my voice. He was Marjorie Taylor Greene before there was Marjorie Taylor Greene. There were LPs of Agnew Zingers recorded and sold in record stores. He was popular among Republicans who wanted Nixon to have an attack dog to punch back at the liberal media. At the hippies, at the Black Panthers, and the liberal media. Anyone resisting Nixon was open fodder for Spiro Agnew. Yeah, crushed him. And then, of course, there's Dick Cheney, who, let's face it, was the actual president. As we referenced at the top of the show, Roy Wood Jr. is right. If they can make not only a documentary, but also a feature film dark comedy about your vice presidency, then you were doing vice presidenting wrong. Now, we don't know what the future holds for Vice President Kamala Harris. What we do know is that President Joe Biden has once again asked her to serve as his running mate and that she is featured very prominently in all of his early re-election ads. What we also know is that none of this carping and nitpicking would be happening if Joe Biden had picked a bland, vanilla white guy as his running mate. A a Tim Kaine, if you will. Uh Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So the next time you see someone sighing a great big theatrical sigh about how Vice President Kamala Harris isn't all that, ask them, compared to whom? Compared to Elbridge Jerry, the vice president after whom the term gerrymandering is named. Or John C. Calhoun, the seventh vice president of the United States, a guy who not only adamantly defended and worked to extend the institution of slavery, but asserted that slavery, rather than being a necessary evil, was a positive good that benefited both slaves and owners, but became the first vice president to resign from office. In his case, it was so he could run for the Senate, where he could more effectively defend the idea of nullification as a means of preserving the institution of slavery. In other words, the vice presidency wasn't powerful enough for him. No. He wanted to be an actual senator. Yeah, where he could do some real damage. Or Aaron Burr, who, as we mentioned, shot a guy. And that guy was the former Treasury Secretary Alexander Hamilton, about which I'm sure you have heard. (laughs) Also, John C. Breckinridge, the only vice president ever forced to flee the country to escape charges of treason. Because after serving as Buchanan's vice president, he actually served as a Confederate general. Yeah. Get out of town, John C. Breckenridge. I believe the city of Breckenridge, Colorado, spelled its name differently just so they wouldn't be associated with him. Ah. And then, of course, there's Major Cassius Starbuckle, who isn't even a real person. He's that windbag played by John Carradine in The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. And I'll bet you... None of the carpers and none of the nitpickers know that. Yeah, so you can just say, well, do you think that she should be more like Major Cassius Starbuckle? What about Cassius Starbuckle, huh? Is she better or worse than him? Just <laughs> or you know, or or Elridge Jerry or any of these people that none of these whiners and complainers and let's face it, right wing media scumbags yep. have ever heard of or know anything about and wouldn't know a vice president from before the last 20 years if it crawled up their leg and bit him on the ass. Mm -hmm. It's a do-nothing job. It's a job that you give to someone once upon a time to carry a state. But that doesn't work anymore. So now it's a job that you give to someone who you want to run with, who will balance your ticket in some way, who will make up for some of your deficits, and who will be ready if there's something happens to you to step into that office. And Kamala Harris checks every box on that list. She's Absolutely. competent, she's qualified, she's extremely affable and funny and well-spoken when she's in front of an audience that respects her. And when she's out giving a speech on a teleprompter, doing what the president tells her to do, sometimes she is not quite as fluid as when she's out there impromptuing, as none of us are, mm-hmm. as you can tell by this podcast. Yeah. So <laughs> um, I'm thrilled that she's running alongside Joe Biden coming up in the uh, next year. 
I'm going to vote for both of them. And I really do hope one day um, when she feels like it, she runs for president and I hope she succeeds. But I am proud and thrilled that both of these people are representing me next fall. And I hope you are too. Uh, when she was announced as, as Joe Biden's running mate in 2000, you and I danced in the kitchen. We did. thought it was awesome. Because we then realized that Joe Biden wanted to win. Yeah, he <laughs> really did. It was a sure sign Joe Biden wanted to win the presidency. Hey, this guy wants to win. Because he had this incredibly talented uh, woman of color on his ticket with him. Mm -hmm. That that was courage. That was a total understanding of where the Democratic Party is, where the nation is, where young voters are, and how to generate excitement for his campaign. Mm -hmm. And we were just thrilled yeah. and still are. And, and he understood where we're going, what right. the future looks like. And the future exactly. looks a whole lot more like Kamala Harris than Joe Biden. And Biden knows that. He, he has shown himself, think about the last, uh, the last three years. Joe Biden has had to navigate incredibly um, dicey situations, um, very thin eyes to get anything done. He's got an enormous amount of stuff done that mm -hmm. I didn't think were, was possible for him to get done. He's had he and his leadership and leadership in the House and the Senate have had to keep everyone on board, everyone in line, everyone who objects to him, everybody who fought against him, all the people who thought he didn't do enough, all those people on board to get anything done. So her job was to not make waves, to not cause headlines, to just be there for whatever he wanted her to do, to preside over the Senate, and not distract from this incredibly delicate, dangerous dance he was doing through a minefield just to get through COVID, the collapse of the global economy, and the fact that the Republican Party are a bunch of fucking fascists. Mm -hmm. And she did that job ably and well. And I'm sure in Biden's second term, He'll have more for her to do because it's, it'll be a new world. Mm -hmm. And I've noticed that Joe Biden is less and less hesitant about calling MAGA Republicans lunatics and wackos, mm -hmm. which warms my heart. And I think, not being Spiro Agnew, she's going to do a hell of a job if he puts her on the job of going out there and kicking Republicans in the balls. Right. Right. Don't forget, we're always looking for more Patreons to make this podcast fly. So if you can afford to support us in that way, please do so at patreon.com slash proleftpod. And thank you for that. You can also make a one-time donation at our PayPal link or mailing address. Both of those are at our website, proleftpod.com. And we really appreciate your support. See you next time. See you next time. The Professional Left Podcast No Fair Remembering Stuff Tuesday edition is produced under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2022-23, DGBG Productions.